Welcome to Christ Life Today, where we explore the glorious realities of life in Jesus Christ. Tonight we are going to finish up the armor of God. Uh, when I started the series, I said that a lot of people start studying the armor of God with Ephesians 6 verse 10, and most of the time people stop studying the armor of God with Ephesians 6 verse 17, uh, and that being the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Uh, just like I went backwards at the beginning to start the armor of God, I'm going to go a few verses forward because it's all about prayer. And so I like to look at the last piece of the armor of God as being prayer. Um, so we're going to read uh, Ephesians 6 verses 18 and through 20 here. Uh, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. <clears throat> so, I find it interesting that after the armor of God, Paul has three verses basically focused on prayer. Uh, <clears throat> we have all the armor of God, which I've been saying ha has been interlinked together. Sometimes peace is used inter interchangeably and all uh, hinged upon the word of God. Well, now the second element of that is it's all hinged on prayer. So it has to be biblical, and then it also needs to be bathed in prayer for effective use of the spiritual armor. And uh, so Paul seeks prayer. In verse 18, he seeks it for all the saints. And verses 19 and 20, he seeks it for himself. And so I, I, the thought hit me was spiritual warfare is a serious matter in the heart of Paul. And serious matters require serious prayer. So that's why I like to say prayer is kind of that last piece of the armor of God uh, in this series. So I wanted to take a look at uh, the some of the different elements of this these three verses that I just read. Uh, with regards to uh, prayer. Uh, the first one I wanted to look at is uh, prayer and supplication. Prayer is speaking with God. This is general praying. It should be worshipful, admiring God, and loving Him. So that's the prayer part of praying always with all prayer and supplication uh, in the Spirit. Supplication is presenting God with needs. Uh, supplication can be either intercessory, which is on behalf of others, or it can be personal for your own needs, uh, prayer and supplication. Um, and we see both here with Paul in these three verses, uh, supplication, praying, uh, it says at the end of 18, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and then the very beginning of verse 19, and for me. So... Uh, there's prayer, there's supplication. Um, the next phrase that I wanted to look at was in the spirit. Uh, Paul desires intense, meaningful, Holy Ghost-led prayer. Paul's not soliciting, uh, wrote, memorized, rehearsed, and ineffective prayers. He's looking for us to pray fervently in the spirit. He wanted and needed earnest prayer. Faith-filled prayers is led by the Holy Spirit. So he asks for prayer for all the saints, again, immediately following the armor of God, because he knows that armor is worn in spiritual warfare. You know, you don't wear armor to a birthday party. You don't wear armor to a wedding feast. You wear armor in battle. So it's not surprising that prayer immediately follows kind of the uh, sword of the spirit, the end of the what we would normally call the end of the armor of God, 
Well, praying always, all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Uh, so Paul's looking for fervent, real, God-led prayers. Um, I think I've said before that uh, if I say, you know, uh, Lord, I want a million dollars. Well, that's a prayer, but apparently it's not God-led, at least not at this time, because he hasn't given it to me. <laughs> and if he's leading me to pray that, he's going to answer. He answers his prayers that he leads us to pray. So that's why we need to be praying fervently in the Holy Spirit. Um, God led faith filled prayers and this is effective praying because it's also not presumptuous this kind of praying is we spend the time necessary to hear the voice of God and pray accordingly and then we can pray in faith because it's not my presumptions that I'm praying. It's what I've heard from God that he wants me to pray for. A uh, great example of that is when you're praying and all of a sudden somebody comes to mind that you haven't thought of in a long time. Well, probably not an accident. I mean, you know, probably God saying, you know, I got something going on here, pray. And if God puts someone on your heart to pray for, he intends to do something about it. It may not be what we think, but he's got plans, he's got purposes. And that goes all with the spiritual warfare and the armor of God. We pray with all prayer and supplications in the spirit so that we can succeed in spiritual warfare. And that's where we're going to go eventually here in these next couple of verses. Um, we're going to see kind of the, the big focus of the spiritual warfare. Uh, but the next thing that I pulled out here, watchful and diligent. It says, uh, watch, you know, watching thereunto with all perseverance. This speaks of the urgency of our warfare. <clears throat> it's essential. It essentially means to be attentively, uh, to be attentively watching and diligent in our prayers and warfare practice. The definition includes staying awake, sleepless. It's part of the definition of that word. Uh, Paul is soliciting diligent, tireless prayers and supplications for all the saints. I don't know about you, but I need it. <laughs> you know, we all need it. So Paul's saying, be watchful, be diligent in your prayer. And as we've talked about the armor of God in your practice, of the spiritual armor and the spiritual warfare that he's called us to. Be watchful, be diligent, uh, and uh, tirelessly awake, sleepless. Now, he's not necessarily telling you to stay awake all night uh, because, you know, I've, I've heard it said sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is sleep, uh, you know, which a lot of times people who are real doers in the kingdom of God. Uh, sometimes deprive themselves of that at times. So and he's not saying, even though this diligent watchfulness includes a sleepless type of an attitude, uh, it's not saying don't sleep when you need it. It's just saying be diligent all the time, watching, praying, praying for all the saints all the time. Uh, and then Paul says, and for me. <laughs> he didn't want to be left out. I'm, th I'm thinking here, some thoughts that came to my mind when, uh, when I read that. And for me, he says, I'm, the thought comes to my mind, we tend to think, rightfully so, but we tend to think of the Apostle Paul as a mighty, powerful, spiritual giant, which he was. I mean, we're not wrong in our thinking there, but sometimes we think in terms of he's on his great pedestal, uh, and he's untouchable, uh, he's, you know, somehow superhuman uh, type of thing. Um, and yet Paul was a powerhouse spiritually, he certainly was. 
But like Elijah, he said, you know, like, yeah, Elijah's a man of like passions as us. Well, when you look at what some of the things Paul said, we see that as great as he was in the Lord, he was still human. And so he asked for prayer for himself. And uh, Paul earnestly, we see Paul earnestly requesting the same types of prayers previously sought for all the saints to be prayed also on his behalf. So, God is not a respecter of persons. He uses human beings. Paul was a human being. He had his frailties and weaknesses. And we're going to see um, this in the next few couple verses as we look. Uh, some very interesting things, I think. Um, the next thing he says is, uh, and, pray, and for me, pray for me, what? That utterance... Freedom of speech and utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Reading the scriptures, does anybody think Paul had a problem with boldness? I mean, I'm just not seeing it. I mean, the man was left under a stone pile. They left him there to be dead. He got up, went back into the city, finished the messages, and then took off. That doesn't sound like a lack of boldness to me. You know? Uh, he's defending himself in front of the Jewish leaders, in front of Romans. Uh, you know, he's in prison, and they find out he's a Roman citizen, and they did bad things that they shouldn't have done to a Roman citizen, so they come kind of quietly and say, uh, you know, Paul, they'd like you to just leave. And Paul said, what? You mistreated a Roman citizen, and you think I'm just going to walk out of here quietly? No, you have them come and escort me out. That doesn't sound like somebody who lacks boldness. When I saw this, I was like, really? Paul's praying that he may have utterance, freedom to speak boldly the way he ought? Really? Then it hits me that uh, Paul's the one doing this teaching on the armor of God. And my guess is that uh, this is not the first time Paul sought prayer for boldness. He's probably been praying it for himself all along. He's probably sought prayer from people he's ministered to and others for boldness all along. Uh, and so probably the reason we don't see a timid Paul is because he's been praying for boldness and he's been asking for prayer for boldness. And this right after teaching the armor of God. <clears throat> that I may open my mouth boldly. So he seeks he seeks utterance. They may be able to speak God's word. That I'll open my mouth boldly. Uh, I just said nearly everything we read about Paul indicates he possessed a real boldness. But he seeks prayer that he might speak frankly and without reservation. So I'm thinking if Paul needed this kind of prayer, you can pray that for me. <laughs> You know, I'll take that kind of prayer that I might speak boldly the way I ought. Uh, because I know I need it. You know, when I talk to people, I can, most every time I ever talk to someone face to face, there's always that little element of, well, it shouldn't be there, but there's that little element of fear. It's like, really, can I do this? You know, should I do this? Is it the right time? Is it the right place? I don't know. And Mark, uh, the Great Commission, tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So I really don't see the exceptions. Um, so I kind of just go in faith on that and trust the Lord to give me the boldness when I need it. Uh, sometimes I'm successful. Sometimes I fail. Thank God for a fresh start <laughs> every time. So, but, you know, I, I need that kind of prayer. Uh, and that he might speak the mystery of the gospel. 
This really, to me, gets to the heart of the armor of God. Um, yes, there's more to it than just the gospel. You know, it's our spiritual walk, our life in Christ. Uh, the gospel is, you know, Jesus, and he's our starting point, but he's also our ongoing keeping. We're kept by the power of God through faith. Uh, and uh, he's, you know, the point where we step from this life into eternity. Come, Lord Jesus. Um, you know, so, uh, but the gospel, Paul says that uh, the to, to preach the, as he ought the mystery of the gospel. Paul wants prayer to boldly proclaim the gospel. Paul desires boldness to tell people about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in our place for our sins. If I'm talking to an unbeliever, that's the only thing I really want to tell them. Because if I get into a debate about other spiritual truth, 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us the natural man cannot can not receive the things of the Spirit because they're spiritually discerned. So, when I saw that, there's freedom in that. What liberty? You know, I don't have to debate abortion with anyone. I'll take the comment, give it a minutes worth of attention and redirect the conversation back to the only spiritual truth that they can get which is the power of God unto salvation the gospel of Jesus Christ and when I learned that what freedom there was in that I don't have to be on a crusade for any cause all I need to do amongst unbelievers is share the gospel of Jesus Christ now how I do that what words what methods? Well, that's between God and whoever, you know, whoever's doing it. But I don't have to be on the crusade with unbelievers to prove or disprove theories or prove or disprove theoretical facts or prove or disprove. I don't even have to prove God. He doesn't need my help. He's very well capable of taking care of himself. The one thing that he wants me to do is share his power, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, share his power unto salvation with everyone that I meet. Mm -hmm. And when the bunny trails come, my job is to get them back on the right trail. You know, that's a good question. I'm not sure I can answer that. But what I do know is that you and I are both going to stand one day before the the great white throne of God, and we're going to stand in judgment. And God only lets holiness, absolute perfection into his heaven. Are you going to get in? They'll usually say, well, you're not perfect. You're right, I'm not. But I'm getting in because of Jesus Christ, who is perfect. Now, are you going to get in? I don't... A long time ago, I stopped playing the bunny trail game. You know... Jesus is my all in all. Whatever they talk about, I can bring it back to him. You know? And so, that, to me, that was a freeing thing. Paul prays for boldness to proclaim the gospel. That's what it's all about. That's what the armor is largely about. Not exclusively, but largely. Uh, then he says about being an ambassador in bonds. This gives us a clue as to one of the reasons why Paul might need to pray for boldness. He's in a Roman prison. You know, Roman prisons were not really the places that were conducive to bold inmates' longevity. Really? I mean, you know, you're in a Roman prison. That's not really the place to be bold in the face of the guard. They didn't need much of an excuse to take care of business. Get in their face. 
Could be a good reason why Paul's praying for Barnabas, because of where he's at. Who's in charge? <laughs> you know, this time he's not in a position to say, I'm a Roman citizen, you know, and this is not that situation. This is a different situation, and he's an inmate. Um, so he's an ambassador in bonds. That's probably a clue as to one of the reasons he may be wavering in his boldness uh, at this point. It says, uh, verse 20, For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein, wherein? Therein. As an ambassador in bonds, that therein, as a prisoner in a Roman prison, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So again, Paul says, I want to speak boldly. This time he uses a different Greek word. Uh, it's not the same Greek word as boldly. The other one was like, Freedom to speak uh, was kind of part of the definition of that. This one is free to speak confidently. So before, I want the boldness to be able to speak. Now, I want the boldness to speak confidently with boldness. Paul's desiring, uh, desiring prayer that he may speak, demonstrating an assurance of his words. Now that's a prayer I'll take too. <laughs> because who's going to listen to us if we're not confident in what we know? I mean, if I'm going to talk to you about eschatology, I'm going to say, I think, I believe, this is my conviction, uh, because while I do have nailed down kind of what I believe, I see validity in some other opinions too on eschatology. So when I, if I was speaking on eschatology, the end times and so on and so forth, I'm not going to be speaking this same boldness, demonstrating an assurance of his words. But when I preach the gospel, there ain't no other one. It's, this is it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. So if you've got a way that's different than that, you're wrong. Period. No discussion. No debate. Quite honestly, you're certainly welcome to your opinion, but I don't care. Because your opinion doesn't form my doctrine, the Word of God does. And if Jesus is only a way, then I might be wrong. God's Word is not wrong. 1 Corinthians 15, first six verses, that's the Gospel of Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection in our place for our sins. And then God adds a little bit over 500 witnesses to his resurrection. Eyewitness accounts are powerful. Uh, so Paul's praise for utterance and the ability to speak boldly, and he's so passionate about it, he uses two different Greek words, uh, and the, gospel, the mystery of the gospel. That's what he wants to the ability to speak boldly about the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Absolute confidence. Nothing in this world can shake me from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it's true. I know it's true. It radically changed my life. And I know a lot of other people whose lives have been radically changed by it. It's true. It doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. And so, with Paul, I'll take those prayers. Pray for me that utterance may be given, that I may boldly speak with all absolute confidence the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
So in light of the armor of God and spiritual warfare, I find it very interesting that uh, Paul prays twice and asks, asks for prayer for boldness, using two different words. And my thinking is, you know, with the testimony that we have of Paul, and he says he needs prayer for boldness, how much more should we be praying and asking people to pray for that kind of boldness? So, I'm asking, for anybody who hears this, pray for me, because I need that kind of boldness. Uh, I want nothing to intimidate me. All things decently and in order. I don't want to I don't want me to be a stumbling block to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but I want the gospel to be that stumbling block. So I'm not praying that I do it arrogantly. I'm not praying that I do it in the flesh. I'm praying for boldness and confidence in Jesus Christ to speak as I ought. Fully equipped in the whole armor of God as we've been talking about. <clears throat> the gospel of Jesus Christ, spiritual warfare is nearly all about the gospel of Jesus Christ because without the gospel, none of the armor is wearable. We don't have any of it. How do you have the helmet of salvation without Jesus? How do you have the breastplate of righteousness without Jesus? How do you have the belt of truth without Jesus? How do you have the shoes of the gospel without Jesus? How do you have a shield of faith without Jesus? How do you have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, without Jesus Christ, who is the word of God? You can't wear armor without the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. The war that the devil and his demons wage against us is largely to stop the gospel from being proclaimed. If we're Christians and all we're doing is warming a chair or warming a pew on Sunday morning, we're not a threat to Satan's kingdom. Yeah, he may have lost us, but we're not a threat to his kingdom. More likely than not, he's going to let you keep warming the pews. Because if he does anything to give you a little bit of hard time, a lot of times that causes people to know Christ to run to Jesus, to get closer to him. So more likely than not, he's going to be satisfied to let you warm a pew and not tell anybody anything. Because at least you're not further ripping off his kingdom. You're not snatching any other souls from hell. So he'll probably leave you alone. But spiritual warfare is largely targeted to stop the preaching and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Satan knows Romans 1.16 he knows it's the power of God for the salvation. So powerful, he knows, the gospel is, that it can yank people out of his realms and put them in the kingdom of light. Satan knows that. That's why he doesn't want us to preach it. That's why he doesn't want us to wear the armor of God. That's why he doesn't want us to walk in victory. He wants dejected, sad, defeated, demoralized Christians. And that's why he's the father of lies. That's why the Bible says Satan comes as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. They're trying to deceive us, to make us impotent in the kingdom of God, to stop us. And it's not uncommon you look through the Bible and you see a whole lot of people God used that didn't want to be used. Moses, not me, Lord, I ain't got no diction. 
actually says something like, I don't wax eloquent in speech, which in his writing sounded pretty eloquent to me, but, you know, just saying. You know, Jeremiah, not me, Lord, I'm a child. Isaiah says, oh, Lord, here am I, send me. And then God tells him what he calls him to do, and the next words out of Isaiah's mouth are, oh, God, how long? And then our best example, Jesus himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, three times prays and asks God, I don't want to do this. He says, if there's another way, Father, let it be. Nevertheless, not what I want, but thy will be done. So Satan knows the power of the gospel and he wants to stop us and he'll throw every excuse under the sun in our ways to stop us from sharing the gospel. You can't speak properly. You don't know what to say. They're going to laugh at you. Might cost you some friends. Friends like that who needs enemies. Uh, Whatever. He's got 6,000 years worth of excuses that he can play around with. He knows them all. So he throws them all in our way. He wants to stop the spread of the gospel because he knows its power. Colossians 1.13 tells us, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. That's the power of the gospel. Translated from the kingdom of darkness. I walked there. Almost 31 years ago, I walked in the kingdom of darkness. And I did it well. Kind of always been one, whatever I've done, I've done well even if it was the wrong thing to do. Um, but God translated me, transformed me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son, the glorious kingdom of Jesus. By the power of the gospel. Somebody, a part-time teacher, teaching a class at the college I went to, who was a full-time evangelist the first day of class, tells me the gospel in public school. You can't do that in a public college. You can't do that in a public college. He did it for 27 years. So, you know, who says you can't? Preach the gospel to every creature. You know, try and do it decently and in order. Don't be ignorant. But I don't see an exception. And it was the power of the gospel that yanked me out of the kingdom of hell, the kingdom of darkness, and put me in the kingdom of Jesus. And I can't tell you how glad I am that someone shared the gospel with me. Can't tell you how glad I am. Um, I just pray that there's people along the way who would be up someday testifying about how glad they are that I shared the gospel with them. Probably many of us that we'll never know. But every once in a while, God gives us a glimpse. That's what we need to keep us going. The purpose of the whole armor of God, we think of armor, we think of battle, we think of protection. Um, but as I was pondering this, the purpose of the whole armor of God is both protection and proclamation. That's our battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, it says here, but against the, Satan and his powers. That's our battle. If the enemy can prevent the gospel from being boldly spoken, he's not in danger of losing more souls, souls destined for hell. Therefore, the whole armor of God exists not just for our protection, but also to keep us preaching his good news. And it's all tied. Footwear, preparation of the gospel of peace. It's all tied together. 
So Romans 10, 13 through 15. <clears throat> For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? It is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Wear the armor of God, which includes footwear. The preparation of the gospel of peace. Have spiritually beautiful feet. How lovely, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. This world is full of bad tidings of evil things. It's full of it. And as we look at news and things like that, it seems to be getting more fuller. Is that a word? I don't know. Uh, but it's getting worse. Though gross darkness covers the face of the earth, it's getting worse, if it's possible. It's getting worse. But in the midst of gross darkness, light shines bright. In this room, if I have a flashlight and I turn it on from where you're sitting, you'll see the light up here. You won't see the beam. You probably won't see what we aim, what I aim it at on the back wall, but you'll see a little bit of light up here. But if we turn all the lights off in this room and it's dark outside so there's no external light, and I turn the flashlight on in the midst of gross darkness, you'll see the beam. We'll illuminate the back banners on the back walls. You see everything. Because in gross darkness, light shines brightest. And you see that in the Bible. When Jesus and others were sharing the gospel with the vilest of sinners, they saw the light. The Samaritan woman ran off and brought the whole town. While the Pharisees thought they were righteous. The woman caught in adultery. The Pharisees thought they were righteous. Moses said we should kill her with stones. They were testing Jesus. Uh, according to Roman law, they didn't have the right to exact the death penalty. Only the Romans did. And that's why they had to take Jesus to Pilate. Because the Romans had the right to the death penalty. The Pharisees couldn't legally kill that woman. They were testing Jesus. Pharisees thought they were right. Woman in gross darkness. Where are your condemners? Does no man condemn you? Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Bright light shines best in gross darkness. So, the challenge as we end is how shall they hear without a preacher? That doesn't mean you have to be ordained doesn't mean you have to be an elder. Doesn't mean you have to have a pulpit or whatever. You're sent. <laughs> you know, go ye into all the world. And in John 17, it talks about believing in the apostle. Jesus prayed of uh, believing in him because of the apostles. But not only them, but those who will believe. So Jesus is praying for all of us. Well, how shall they hear unless someone goes? How are they going to go unless they're sent? Well, Jesus sent you. And then, go and tell them glad tidings of good things. I can't think of anybody in this world who doesn't need to hear glad tidings of good things. Because there's so many bad tidings of wicked and evil things. So, as we wrap up, my final two thoughts. It is time for spiritual warfare. It is time to preach the gospel. Thank you for watching this broadcast. For more information about the ministry God has entrusted to us, please visit our website at 
www.christ-like.net. Our Christ Life site offers many free downloadable resources. We hope you will visit us online soon and that our ministry will bless and strengthen your Christian life.